Oh, y'all, y'all going in. Y'all going in. <laughs> y'all are going in. No, uh, uh. I said it was common. No biggie. No pock. I know. <laughs> Snoop Dogg. He was just here not too long ago. Um, so no. Welcome. What's up? Going on? What's going on? Salt City. What's happening? What's happening? Now, um, I have just a disclaimer, real quick. I have this knee. It's like a. It feels like a water a balloon in my knee. Um, I got to get an MRI tomorrow. The doctor said I might have a torn meniscus. And that sounds cool to me. Cause like, yeah, I'm a, like my super athlete kind of comes. Yeah, I was I got a torn meniscus. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't even where it was at, what the meniscus is. But I say that to you because in case I'm, because I walk a lot when I pre, my knee has buckles. Don't trip. Don't, don't, even, don't even bug out. So we're going to practice a, <gasps> in case it happens so we get that out the way. So ready? There you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. Because I will preach on the floor. I will just lay here and keep preaching. <laughs> What's going on? Yo, so we are honored that um, um, a friend of mine, um, is, is Curtis Blow, and Curtis Blow called me, and then we brought in KRS-One to the firehouse a couple weeks ago. KRS-One, BDP, BDP, BDP. Um, and so we're celebrating our efforts of 50 years of hip-hop through our Fire Fest, which is August the 12th. And it's going to be featuring La Russell, who's a phenomenal MC out of Vallejo, California, and a bunch of artists, D1, a bunch of local artists, Brittany Carter uh, from Chicago. So it's a free 95 event on uh, August the 12th if you have time to come out from noon until 9 o'clock at night. But let's pray. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this great group of people who you created in your image. Open our hearts and minds up now, God, that we would eat the food, the nutrients from your word that we need, the steak the spaghetti, the, the Similac, Infamil, whatever it is we need for your nourishment, God, that we would grow and continue to mature and hear you're calling us uh, to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Virgil was born blind. He was born blind, and his parents walked with him, all, of course, all throughout his life so he could live a more normal, as normal can be, a life as a blind young boy to a young man, and he did that very successfully. His parents heard about a doctor like in Australia somewhere, who had uh, some kind of surgical procedure where people who were born blind were able to see. And they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that was some kind of gimmick. They fly to Australia, find that this doctor is legit. They meet the people who are born blind who now can see. They come back, they tell their son, they tell Virgil. He said, okay, I trust y'all, let's do that. They go and they get the surgery. And they, you know, bandage him up. He had to be bandaged for a couple of weeks for the swelling to come down. They bring him back home. And after a couple of weeks, they take the bandages out. And the boy can see some images, sees his mom's face for the very first time. The the boy is seeing. And they're like ecstatic. He's in his own apartment. He knows his way around. So they're ecstatic. They're celebrating. And they go back home. And and they go by and see him, you know, periodically, you know, throughout this new discovery over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and And then they notice something as they keep coming back, that Virgil is still living like a blind person like he was before he had this sight. And they're like, wait, did something happen? Is something reversed? Something going on we didn't know about? They call the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, just because someone can see doesn't mean they have sight. I'm, I'm going to say that, I'm gonna say that one, more, one more time. Just because somebody can see doesn't mean that they have sight. He kept living as a blind person because though he could see, he didn't have sight. Sight, that's like people who have knowledge but no wisdom. Come on, y'all know some brilliant fools right here. Y'all know some brilliant fools. Y'all know some smart fools. Man, they, they brilliant, but they can't manage nothing right. <laughs> they got no wisdom on this other end. It's kind of like the, the, the person who worked all day in their yard cutting grass. I mean, from 8 to 8, they were, they were out there sweating there. It's hot. Uh, they're getting the grass together, they're putting plants down, shrubs, getting the, the whole house together. Come in, I mean, they're so sticky with the sweat, shirt sticking to them. They take a shower, use the whole, whole tube of shower gel. Get out of the shower, put them in the same dirty clothes. What the what? Some of y'all are like, what's wrong with that? Some, some, some of y'all are like, what's the problem? What's the problem? The reality of having, having, having been able to see, but not having sight, is just that dichotomy in that context. God calls us to be cleansed. He calls our hearts to be cleansed. He calls us to be renewed. He calls us unto himself. And what's, what's, what's beautiful about God is that, is that he calls us. Like nobody comes to God unless God calls you. No, nobody, come, nobody goes to the IRS and be like, you know, I just want to give you this $1,000. Don't worry about it. You know, 
Am I right? Nobody just goes to the IRS because they voluntarily want to go. God nudges you. This situation calls you to check your heart. This person says something. This prayer. Why did that happen? God calls you and calls you and calls you repeatedly to come to himself to get cleansed so that you can not only just see, but you can have sight. God calls you to that because he has a plan for your life. He's guided. He guided and directed you to, to his life. But some of us have a, have a phone where you have different people's name on the phone. Don't pick up this fool. He talked too much. She talked to you. Y'all don't got phones like that. With different, you, you, it's Phil Jackson's name, but it's, I come up, he talked too much on the call. So you're going to ignore that call. I'm like the only one who knows people with, with numbers like that. Uh -huh. I know some single people, male and female, who have different names of different people who call. Don't talk to them at all. Too much temptation on this. No, no, no. I know. Yeah. God calls us, but what do you have on his name as listed? When he calls you, he calls you unto himself that you can be free in him. God calls us today to come correct. Now, in the hood, that's a phrase means, you know, come correct. Come with everything you're going to bring. But bring it all and be vulnerable and open and transparent. And, and come correct. Don't come halfway. Don't come part of the way. Come correct. In our text today, in Matthew chapter 22, Christ calls us to come correct. He's talking to these to, to, the, to the religious elite, the religious insiders, if you will. You look at Matthew 21, 23, the chapter before that. He says, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By the authority, by what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? So he's talking to the folks who know a little something, something about God, about the word, and, and, and their teaching. And look, Look what happens in verse 45 of the same chapter. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. See, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's what parables do. I mean, that was a good story. Oh, oh wait a minute. That, that's what I do. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, we, so they, they, they hear all these stories. They're asking who's authority. And then after they listen again, oh, oh he's talking about us, Joe. He's talking about, oh, we're going to have to kill this fool. We've got to kill this fool. What are we talking about? They, they want to stone the man. They want to stone the man, right? So Jesus, in his brilliance, probably already knew that was going on. And then he adds this other piece in chapter 22, verse 1 and 3. He said, let me, tell you, let me tell you another story. Let me tell you this other story. And he says, Jesus spoke to them in, in, in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Now, what I'm going to try to do in this story as we break down the various verses of it, I'm going to try to do a dual interpretation study of it, meaning that the words and the story, but then what the interpretation or the understanding and some of the backstory of that, right? So, so the king is God. The son is Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is the banquet where we are all to come, where God is calling us to come. Now, about this part right here, he says, he sent his servants to those who had been invited. Go back, go back. Who had been invited. Who had been invited. So they had already got an invitation before we read this story. They had already nude, as we say on the west side, nude um, that they were supposed to come. <laughs> they nude it. They nude it. And so because of that, he's like, wait a minute, I got, we got to just go tell the people. So he sends the people out. He sends his servants who, to tell them who had been invited, yo, it's time to come. It's time to come. They're like, I'm good. That you got the invitation already, but now you say, I'm good. It is understood, perhaps, that these people who were the servants who went out were the patriarchs of old, whether it was Abraham or Moses or Daniel or David. There were others who came before to say that to the specific community of the children of Israel, yo, come to Yahweh. Come to God. He loves you. Come to God. You are his chosen people. Walk in his ways. I'm good. I'm cool. So they didn't listen. It goes on. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been sent, who have been invited, that I prepared dinner. I got some rib tips, you know what I'm saying? I got some candy yam, I got some fish, I got the fillets, I got the grill. You know what I mean? I even got some mushrooms for folks who don't eat no meat, right? <laughs> and the fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Like, how much more can your saliva, can, oh my gosh. I mean, how much more can he coerce you and move on you to come? You see, the beauty about this whole text is that the king don't ask but one time. 
I'm a boss at the firehouse. They call me a boss. I'm a founder and CEO. And they say, Phil, that's what they tell me. They say, Phil, nobody should talk to you but so-and-so and so-and-so. I said, no, this ain't American gangster. This is not American gangster. Not American gangster. I want to talk to the people. So they, but, but they try to help me so that I don't interfere and get into different stuff. That's really what they're trying to say. That's what they're trying to say, right? But, they, but, but in this story, the king invited you one time. That's enough. The story, what I'm trying to say here, is that he's showing his mercy by asking you again. He says, you see, in, 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 in our culture, we have... Um, um, uh, in the Eastern culture, Eastern culture is more of, a, more of a shame-based culture. So for the king to ask a second time, it's almost like, wait, they're not coming? We gotta, it would seem as if that's the approach. But this is not that approach for this king as he's mimicking God's mercy saying, I'm going to ask you again. You got the invitation, I'll ask you again. You didn't come. I'm, I'm, matter of fact, I'm going to ask you again, and, and I'm going to tell you, we got the fattened calf. We are ready for you. We got all the, why does the king have to coerce you? What does God have to do to get you to come? You see, us in this room have come. You've come to church today. Nudge, begrudgingly, you came, or you got a text. Um, you, you, you're here. You came. You came. But have you really come? <laughs> Are you seen, but you don't have sight? They're seen. I've been invited, but I don't have sight to come. Look what else happens. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business, the rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his army and destroyed those and burned their city. First group, understanding it theologically, the patriarchs, the matriarchs of old. Hey, follow Yahweh. This is the way of God. Follow Yahweh. You are his chosen people. I'm good. Hey, hey, I got the fattened calf for you. Come. Another invitation. These are the, this is the third invitation right here. One invitation we don't know. Another invitation we do know because they said no. Another invitation, now they, they kill it. This invitation are the prophets who the actual Israel is known to have killed for coming boldly to say, God's called you this way. Look what it says in verse 37 of the same chapter. It says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you. How often have I longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you are not willing. You see what's happening right here? I tell you, you got a fattened calf, y'all come. Oh, I, I, I tell you all to come. You say, I got to go. I got to get some new Jordan. The Jordans is out. I can't come. I can't come to the banquet. They're going to have a line for the Jordan. I'm, I'm out. I got, and then the other cats say, we tired of these cats coming, telling us the banquet's here. God, love. we're going to kill these prophets. And Christ says, even in that text, Oh, how I've longed to hold you like a, like a, like a hen to its chicks. I've, I've longed to give you this mercy, to extend this love to you, but you have denied me. This is the exemplary mercy of God. This is what the kingdom culture is like. It is a kingdom culture that says, you don't deserve the mercy, but I'm extending the mercy. I invited you one time, and you didn't hear me. I invited you two times, and now you push back from me, and you kill me. How many times has God knocked on your heart? I mean, God, so, so, hey, I, I got baptized. That's, that's a part of coming. But sometimes I believe we come when it's going to be most convenient. I'm going to come when it's convenient. The AC's on? Cool, I'm coming. Got parking? I'm coming. I'm going to come when I don't have to sacrifice, when I don't have to offer anything other than just being there. Now, now, in the midst of that, there are consequences for that reality, right? But God still calls us. Because even in the midst of this, it was hundreds and hundreds of years of God calling Israel to himself. It wasn't just like, I'm going to call you tomorrow, I'm gonna, it was a judgment the next day. No, no, no. I'm calling you to myself for hundreds and hundreds of years. As Christ is prophesying, go back to um, the last verse we were at. It says, the king was enraged, and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. The passage we read before is almost prophetic of Christ actually destroying the city. That prophetically, he sends out Rome and Titus in 87 AD um, after death to actually capture Israel. And actually, that verse prophesied, was prophesied by Christ to hold them accountable. That, that judgment 
of the children of Israel. How often have you pushed back from the call of God? Some of us, I think, we like the idea of God. I like the idea of God. The idea of God is great. I like the idea of following Christ. I like the idea of studying the word. I like the idea, but I don't really want to dive into it when it's going to have to cost me something, when I'm going to have to really commit to something, when I'm going to have to sacrifice something. Look what it says in the next verse. Then he said to his servants, here's another invitation, the fourth invitation. If somebody invited you four times, how would you feel about that? Or if you, on the other end, you invite somebody four times, they begging. They must have had no friends. They ain't got nobody coming to this thing. I ain't never, they must not have anyone, right? Ain't nobody going to, come on, y'all. Ain't nobody going to be there if they ask me four times, four times. You see the mercy extended to you and me with our ratchet behind? God is extending that mercy to us for no reason that we, out of our own merit, See, we live in a mercyocracy, <laughs> mercyocracy. It is God's mercy that you breathe right now. It is God's mercy that you sit here right now. It is God's mercy that we endure every day through life. But in that mercy is joy and peace and, 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 and grace that he extends to us in that kingdom of heaven. He said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited didn't deserve to come. So go to the streets, to the hood, to the block, to the alleys, and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out <laughs> to the streets and gathered all the people they could, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. I like that, the bad as well as the good, because you know Ronell was up in there. <laughs> you know, that boy drunk like a mom. Hey, we're going to the banquet, y'all. I'm straight. I'm good. You know Ronell was in there. He invited everybody. This is the fourth invitation. Invited everyone to come. Now, this is to be understood as the apostles. Beside the children of Israel who began to reject Christ, now it's all of us who are not from the children of Israel, part of God's plan to be invited to the kingdom of heaven, the mercy of God. So watch what happens. As the king, you go to the next verse. The, as the king invites you, he's inviting you from the street the good and the bad. He knows you were not invited prior to. So the king is not going to make you come in and be in shame. He can make sure you geared up. He can make sure you're straight. So the king has provided wedding gear for you. So you walk in the door with a nice suit on that you never had before. You walk in the door given grace extended to you for what you didn't have, he prepared for you. Amen. Amen. I, I'm, I'm going to say amen to my own self. I need that for my own self because my stuff ain't always together, man. My stuff is not always together. And I need the grace of God to give me what I can't do for myself in the midst of that reality. They couldn't do for themselves. They weren't invited. Now they're invited. And they're in the kingdom of heaven. They're in this banquet to party with the sun, to be with the sun. And the grace and mercy of the king Extended to them with no merit on their own. He gears them up. Everybody comes in. You wear this. What's your size? Let me measure your neck. Okay, cool. Go over there and see Samantha. Okay, come on, huh? Go see Reginald. And bam, they hook in your the bag will kick in. The king walks in, but the king came in to see the guests and noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How'd you get in here without wearing clothes, friend? The man was speechless. That means he knew better. <laughs> oh, y'all ain't ever been speechless? <laughs> so what happened? Well, uh, you, want, you want some more tomato sauce? You want more tomato sauce? You don't want to say. <laughs> he, receiving the mercy of God, chose not to come. The coming was to come correct, meaning that I don't want to put on this robe, but God, you must have something else in mind for me. I don't want to walk in this path. God, it's hard for me to walk in this path. This sacrifice is hard. It's challenging. It's hard to get up in the morning and prepare lunches and to serve to a new neighbor. But God, you're calling me to do that. And, 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 and in the midst of that, God's grace and mercy shows up. So this man chose not to put on the clothes that were freely given without you having to do nothing for it. And the king calls him friend. Oh, my God. That's another extension of mercy and grace. That's my friend. How come he didn't put the gear on? 
We got the Nikes to match the new Jordans. We got, we, you got you straight. And was speechless. And then the scriptures say, in the next verse, the king told the attendants, time, hand and foot, and throw him outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that seems hard. Seems hard, right? But the thing is, you and I, if, as we are followers of Jesus Christ, and you've made a choice to follow Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, you're following Christ. That's, that salvation is secure in God. It's, it didn't come from you, it came from God, so God locks it in, secure. However, we tend to jump, even though you're in his hand, we jump from knuckle to knuckle, wild and out, right? I believe this, I understand the two of these aspects of this text. The, the one aspect is that though we are followers of Christ, the scriptures talk about that our works will be tried by fire in Corinthians. And if our works are tried by fire in their gold, silver, precious metal, they will withstand. Our, our works are the, the, the inheritance we have received, and our gratitude for that inheritance, we serve, we live, we live righteously, we serve righteously, right? We, we walk righteously. Gold, silver, precious metal. Then those who serve, who, who love the Lord, commit to Christ, your works will be tried by fire, and it will be wheat, hay, or stubble, and it will be burnt up. But you'll come through the fire saved and delivered, but the works will be burnt up. So I believe in one end, my man's works were burnt up. <laughs> in one context, that you come through here, you, didn't ex you, you, you saw the mercy of God to even come to the banquet. You saw the grace of God to give you what you didn't have, and you chose not to. And you got to bounce. And your works, you're still my son. You're my friend. But your works didn't merit you to be in this award, reward. This other part of the meaning is this. I believe we're thrown at the banquet a bunch of different times. <laughs> Let me tell you what I mean. I married a beautiful woman in 1985. We just celebrated 38 years this past July, right? Beautiful, beautiful. I would have put her picture on here, but I didn't ask her first because she, that's not the one I want to see. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. <laughs> so I've not been that. So it happens when you're married 38 years. You know these things, right? So, uh, <laughs> so but 85, we get married. 86, I'm wilding. I'm wilding. Now, at 15, I came to faith in Christ. I came. I got baptized. I was in Sunday school. High school, I renewed, recommitted. I came. I married. I heard the coming. Live righteously with your family. Be wise with your family. I, my, my, my identity was wrapped in this job. I got fired from the job. My identity got broken up. And my wife and I were married, and we just had a baby, and she needed a husband and a man to be there and support the family, but I wasn't that guy because my identity was wrapped in the wrong stuff. Separated eight or nine months, four months into the separation. A dude who didn't even know the Bible said, man, what's your relationship with God? I said, my relationship is, is about a nine because he knew Kim. He knew we were separated. I said, man, I know Romans 3, 23, Romans 5, 8, Romans 10, 9 to 10, Romans John, John 10, 10. You can't tell me nothing. He said, man, your relationship is a zero. I went, <laughs> how are you going to tell me? I'm, I'm, I'm kicked out the banquet. I'm living so foul. I'm, I came, I'm, I'm, I'm in his hand, but I'm living so foul. I'm kicked out the banquet. I'm tired of hand and foot, thinking my stuff is straight. I'm good. What you mean? That's her fault. She did all that. No, no, no. Man, for four months, God used this cat. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't even know the Bible. He opened the Bible from, we worked till midnight. From midnight to two, three in the morning, he just opened the Bible. And we just read and read. And what I had, when I came to Christ at 15, I all of a sudden came unearthed. And I came back into the banquet. <laughs> I put on the clothes that God gave me to put on. And I walked in that boy struck me. Because I knew, I knew and experienced the mercy of God. I knew what it's like to be outside the banquet. I knew what it's like to be tied hand and foot and thinking you're on your own thing. I knew what it meant to see but not have sight. And I didn't want to experience that anymore. My wife and I got back together. And 38 years later, we're celebrating and partying and kicking it. But I'm telling you, that's what's missing on the other side of your life if you don't come. Oh, I feel like I came, I got baptized. That's great. That's a, that's a beautiful space. You know he's nudging you more. You know God is nudging you more. The scriptures say that in this text, for many are called, but few are chosen. He went out to choose them. Come, bad and good. Come. He's coming to you. How am I? He's coming to you with all of your mess, all of your stuff. Come, come, come. I got your front, your back, your side to side. Come, trust in the mercy of God. Trust in me. That's the kingdom culture. The mercy is unending. 
Nah, I'm good. I got to get these Jordans. Oh, I'm going to kill these fools. Now I'm going to wear the wrong thing. I don't want to, I want to, I want, I want to know about God, but I want to know God. It was a man in 1987 in Niger, Nigeria who was in jail already for seven years. He was in jail for seven years. And um, the judge brought him forth. It was time for his court date. And as he came up, the judge, hearing the different defenses again, said, this man is pardoned. Gave the man a pardon after seven years in the jail, in, in the prison. The man did not take the pardon. The man said, I don't want to take, send me back to prison. The man hit the hammer. The judge, no, you're pardoned. You, you are free. You can go. You are free. No longer do you have to be outside of the banquet. You're in the banquet. You are free. It took six guards to hold this man back, fighting them. He was fighting them to go back to prison. They sent him back to prison. See, a pardon is only good as those who accept it. <laughs> a pardon is only good as those who hear the coming, come to me. Uh, uh, that, that calling, that invitation is only as good as those who accept it. You see, Christ came four times. The king came four times. He put shame on his back. Though I'm a king, I'm asking you again. And though you may look at me as, how was a king keep asking? He must not have nobody to come to his party. You may have an attitude with that. He said, I'll take the shame because you're worth it. I put on a cross on my back because you're worth it. I took lashes because you're worth it. I had spit on because you're worth it. They lied on me because you're worth it. I'll take the shame because you're worth it. Come correct doesn't mean you got to come correct and get fixed before God. It just means, God, I'm, I'm here. What you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? I'll walk in your ways. And in the midst of that, your heart is healed, nourished, restored in areas you didn't think you even needed because you don't know what you don't know until you surrender to his calling. Today, y'all, where you at in this kingdom culture? Are you, are you spitting in the eyes of God's mercy because of some shame in your life? God, I don't know, though, because I don't know. Got you. I'm calling the good and the bad. Whatever you define as bad, what do you find as good? I'm calling them all. Today, 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 let it be the day that you hear that call. Let it be the day that you've already heard the call, but you come a little closer. Let it be the day where you take off the other clothes and put on the clothes of righteousness. Don't pull back when God says you are pardoned. <laughs> no more life sentence. No more jail sentence. No more bondage. The chains are free. Accept the call. Accept the invitation. The mercy and the grace is waiting for you. Let's pray. We all stand. We all, we all stand. We all stand. Man, God, you are... <laughs> there's no doggone English words to even explain how great you are. But you are all that. You are all that. And God, let us this day be brought forth before you with the realization that perhaps we've been seen all the time, but we're scared of the sight. <laughs> we're scared of it, so we want to kill the prophets. We want to run from the prophets. We want to do something different. We want to ignore God. Let us this day. Though we've come, we've come to this place, though we've come to you by faith, though we've walked in your ways, God, let us come again. Let us receive that invitation and not walk from it. Because on the other side of that invitation is more than what we could even fathom or think about, fathom or even imagine of the grace, the, 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 the nourishment of our hearts and minds and spirit, the healing that's there. God, let us answer to your call, your invitation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.